I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Kim Kellaway and I'm Head of Clients and Markets at HLB Man Judd and I will be your host. I would particularly like to welcome all of our new ENFP community members and I'm very excited to inform you that our ENFP community has grown to 1,043 members with the very lucky Blake Tierney, Executive Manager of FIA being our lucky 1,000th member. So congratulations to you, Blake. So the topic for our presentation today is strategic planning. In our February webinar, we polled our attendees on what areas in their organisation were they focusing on over the next 12 months, and 58% of responders indicated strategic planning. From that, we launched our strategic planning survey, and we had over 100 not-for-profit leaders participate with 100% completion rate. And again, I would like to thank those that participated. Our presenters today are Simon James, Partner Corporate Advisory, Not-for-Profit Specialist, and Natalie Tiek, Corporate Advisory Senior. In our presentation today, both Simon and Natalie will present the findings from our recent Not-for-Profit Leaders Survey, our approach to strategic planning, some case studies, outcomes of the strategic planning session, and leading a strategic plan. So I'll now hand it over to you, Simon. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Thank Kim. Excellent. So we've got lots of people that are involved in strategic planning, which is, the, I suppose, the main thing here. So we've got the right audience, which is great. Um, so as kind of Kim alluded to in that introduction, um, we're going to kind of step through the results of the survey um, on a few slides and, and kind of just share some anecdotes that kind of... Um, come th uh, from those slides and those findings. So first up, you know, what is strategic planning? The, I like the Edison quote around good fortune is what happens when opportunity meets with planning. But uh, the, the Robbins one also kind of you know, comes through pretty strongly in terms of the adoption of courses of action and the allocation of resources necessary to achieve the organization's goals. So I kind of look at it as, you know, picking a future state of where you want to be and then coming up with a road to get there. Now, there's lots of different roads that you can probably take to get to the, the, your future state. So the strategic planning decisions and assessments are kind of deciding on which road to take, which one gets you there, whether it's faster, less risky, uh, least expensive way of, get, uh, of getting to where you want to be. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Nat, who's going to talk us through the first kind of question that was on the strategic planning. Thank you, Simon. Next. So our first question of the survey uh, was whether your organisation has a strategic plan. And pleasingly, over 95% of organisations do. There is a slight concern for those that answered no, as strategic plans are relevant for every organisation. Next. So our next question was on when the strategic plan was last reviewed. Given what's happened over the past year with COVID, it isn't surprising that the majority of organisations have reviewed their strategic plan in the last six months. However, that 40% uh, of organisations have only reviewed their strategic plan in the last 12 months or even longer is a bit more of a surprise. Not-for-profits typically have 30 junior ends so we're guessing that there's a lot of budgeting happening now. Hopefully the budgeting process follows the finalization of strategic plans. And please, as we're speaking, if you have any questions or comments on what we're talking about, please enter into the chat box. Next. So the next survey question was on whether there is any clarity um, in the strategic plan on where you compete and how you compete. These results surprised us as only 58% define this. Where you compete covers the markets and clients your organisation is targeting, 
and the how to compete is the products, price and services delivered to your target market. Answering these two components allows you to understand what your organization's differentiating factors are and is what makes the plan strategic. So now on to question four regarding the frequency of monitoring a strategic plan. So we appreciate the results of this question is heavily impacted by the type of role um, the respondents are in their organization. For example, we would expect management or operational personnel to monitor the progress of strategic priorities more frequently, say weekly or monthly, and those in the board roles to review less frequently, but still enough to maintain accountability and ensure that the organisation is heading in the right direction. So from the survey, the most common response was quarterly, which is what we would expect. For anyone who answered monthly, we're hoping that this applies more to those in management roles as opposed to board roles. And if you're only looking at your progress annually, that's too infrequent. Next. Okay, so the next question of the survey was whether your organisation has a business model with sensitivities. Um, from our perspective, this is one of the most important questions that we asked. And as a business model with sensitivities is pivotal to strategic planning. And we commend that the 41% who responded that they do have a model and are surprised that the remaining 60% either don't have one or are not sure if they have one or not. Having a business model with sensitivities is a key tool in assessing the adequacy and risk of a strategic plan. Strategic planning involves making some big assumptions on factors that will either happen or not happen and it's imperative to understand the implications both ways, including the impact on surpluses and the level of investment that may be required. A model then becomes proof that a strategic plan could work and allows the board to make better informed decisions. A good financial model will clearly define the assumptions, allow these to be altered in real time and will reduce the risk of any surprises. Simon, we've done a lot of um, this financial modelling work in the past, haven't we? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And that, that it's probably worth um, using it while well, we're probably dropping a few examples to kind of explain what we've done here, um, because, you yeah, know, this is kind of critical. So uh, first example, we did a, a strategy piece for a, a board of a large membership organisation. Um, uh, it, it's got significant assets but was loss making and the, the board have been hesitant over a number of years about the way to go from a strategic planning uh, point of view because they just weren't sure which way uh, or what would happen and when you've got a kind of split board in terms of uh, it stagnated in the ability to make decisions uh, it was stuck so we kind of assisted management with building uh, a membership model uh, that do you want to kind of explain what we, we kind of did here? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, so as mentioned, the organisation has significant assets and this is in the form of properties and investments. So our first step in building the financial model to be used uh, to assist the strategy was to remove any of these items which relate more to the treasury function of the organisation so that we could focus on the operations and the underlying business. So once we had done this, it was clear that the current price and product uh, strategy that was employed was not working as the income which was generated from the members was insufficient to cover the cost. So using a financial model, we were able to demonstrate this point very clearly, as well as calculate what the break even points would have to be, both in terms of the member numbers versus the membership price uh, based on the current strategy. And this did present um, some you know, varying options. Uh, in this example, the financial, uh, financial model acted as a tool to allow the board to have more productive discussions around options, which led to some strategic decisions being made, such as increasing the membership price significantly, which otherwise may not have occurred. Uh, from our perspective, this was a great outcome considering where um, the organisation was when we had started. Yeah, no, it's a very good example, and it was a you know very sophisticated model, but it it, it got the organisation moving forward. Um, another example, we we helped a, a small community-based organisation at the start of COVID. Uh, the board were concerned around the ongoing viability, uh, as many organisations were when kind of COVID hit. 
so we, the, the, the piece of work was to review the forecast model that was prepared by the financial uh, team. And it was kind of clear when we looked at it, there was very little interaction between the finance team and the operations team. Uh, and you, you couldn't really flex any of the assumptions within the model to see what would happen if various scenarios played out. So it wasn't fit for purpose for decision making, which is probably why the board brought us in. Um, and if you've got poor information, you potentially get poor decisions being made and that put the organization under tremendous risk. So key takeaway from that piece of work was, you know, whoever's building any kind of financial models as part of this strategic planning process needs to interact very closely with the operations people and the, the models need assumptions built into it um, that are clear and able to be flexed. Um, fi a final example on this, Nat uh, built a financial model to assist a consortium of not-for-profits um, when they were trying to work out their strategy, um, which may or may not have had something to do with ADAC. <laughs> Uh, yes, you know, we were engaged by the consortium to assist in their BIP strategy for services which were transitioning from the government to the community sector. To enable the consortium to make strategic decisions in relation to their BIP strategy, we created a financial model which included sensitivity analysis. Using the model, the consortium got to a position of understanding under what scenarios they were prepared to take on any of the contracts and what financial compensation would be required to move forward. Thanks, Nat. So I just want to close off this point by saying that financial models going hand in hand with strategy uh, is an assessment tool. Without a decent model, you can't test or assess your strategy. Uh, use the models to assess which road you take to get to your kind of future state. Okay. Um, we asked on in the survey on a scale of one to 10, how hard is it to achieve your organization's strategic goals? One being easy, 10 being very difficult. So as you'll see on the kind of results, the, the scores that, you know, in terms of people thinking it's, you know, medium to slightly hard in terms of achieving their strategic plan. It was quite interesting when we're looking at the results um, internally and we're kind of assessing this, we, um, we said, well, okay, yeah, how hard should it be to achieve your strategic plan? Um, and we couldn't actually get to any consensus amongst the kind of advisory group internal about how hard should it be. So I thought, oh, well, let's don't uh, let's ask the panel. Let's ask the uh, the audience. In. So just quick uh, poll question: How hard should it be to achieve your strategic goals? If you can just drop something on there, that would be sensational. You got the results, Kim? Uh, they're saying it's very challenging. So Very we've actually challenging. only got either moderate or challenging, and 70% have said it's challenging. Right, wow. Okay, uh, that's what, yeah, that's so it should be. I, I agree. I think uh, from, a, uh, from, from what I've seen on it, uh, your corporate goals should be similar to personal goals. They should follow the same framework. Uh, we use SMART internally, which is specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic, and timely. Um, so, you know, corporate goals should probably uh, follow something very similar. Okay, next slide, please, Kim. This was an interesting one because um, the, the question was asking how much is the investment um, in the strategic plan in terms of revenue? You know, how much are we spending on the strategic plan effectively? There was, um, it, it was quite interesting. The two biggest se segments here are, are not sure, which is uh, slightly concerning because I suppose a strategic plan should be costed and we should be looking for a return on investment of the kind of strategic plan. So whatever we're doing, how much is it going to cost us? Are we measuring against that? Does that make sense? Um, which is great. Uh, but also there's the, the, the gray quadrant and the thing there's 20% are spending more than 10% of revenue on their kind of strategic plan. So I thought, wow, that's, that's great. You know, what, what is driving that? Um, I think there's potentially some one-off factors that are floating through the NFP community this year, uh, basically stimulated by JobKeeper. Um, lots of organizations were eligible for that. And um, as a result, lots of organizations did get a, a, a fairly sizable cash flow boost. Um, and from what we've seen and heard and the conversations we've been having with clients, 
some of that money is actually being uh, used um, strategically on um, on kind of strategic plans and actually doing something um, productive with it. Nat, do you want to do the next one? Yes, so next. So the next question was whether the organization's strategic plan relies on drawing down or the investment of historical surpluses. Uh, the majority of respondents said no, and there could be a number of reasons for this, um, such as the result of the JobKeeper payment, as Simon just mentioned, or perhaps the organization is generally profitable, um, or they might be benefiting from the usage of uh, specific grants that they've been able to um, obtain and use towards uh, the organization strategy. Um, so just a brief point on that. We understand that there are a number of foundations out there which do offer, um, say, capacity building grants, which not-for-profits may be able to use to deliver parts of their strategy. Next. Okay, so this question was um, where we asked um, respondents to group strategic priorities uh, within the following categories, uh, what the organization's focus was for each category. So if we just take a look at the categories first in the graph, and we'll start from right to left. Uh, the rightmost uh, section we have is customer recruitment and retention, which relates to the where to compete. Um, and then follow all the remaining categories make up the how to compete. So this includes people recruitment and retention, that is employees, managing finance, operational effectiveness, managing risk, and M&A partnerships and alliances. So the result of this question, um, it's not surprising that customer recruitment and retention is one of the highest uh, focus areas, and that's what we would expect. Um, but then we also see that managing finance is the area of highest focus uh, from our survey respondents. This is quite intriguing, and it ties back to the previous results of the survey, such as respondents, uh, say 30% of respondents not knowing how much is invested into their strategic plan, and organisations not having financial models with sensitivities being run. So this uh, points to an overall sense of concern around finance. We're also surprised at the focus on people, so people recruitment and retention, being employees, um, is a bit lower than some of the other categories, such as managing finance or operational effectiveness, um, which is uh, the opposite to what we see in our for-profit client base. And this is also surprising based on our conversations with not-for-profit clients um, who frequently say that they're struggling to recruit, say, frontline workers. And so we would have expected the results of the survey to show this as a higher area of focus. So we ask this question with these specific categories, as this is how we facilitate our strategic workshops, um, which is our strategy link framework. Uh, that is customers, uh, customer recruitment and retention is the where to compete, and all the other categories make up the how to compete. Simon, do you want to speak a little bit more about what HLB can offer regarding strategy sessions? Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, we, we run uh, and facilitate strategic planning workshops, uh, and that can be obviously whole day events. We can do all the planning beforehand, but we, we can take a really tailored approach to elements of strategy. Um, and just work with management team or with boards in terms of um, a flexible approach to, to help them kind of set strategy. So it's not a one size fits all. We've got a, a, a great methodology and I believe we're gonna send out the um, the brochure. There you go, a brochure that's got it in our uh, not-for-profit uh, community brochure actually talks about this strategy link there, but it's, um, yeah, it is a, a very flexible approach, um, but it's kind of tried and tested and, and works very well. Um, right, before I change to the next slide, the final question uh, we asked in the survey was, what uh, is unique in your organization's strategic plan uh, that your competitors are not doing? Now, I'm gonna present a word cloud um, the, of the kind of responses that came back. So just have a think about what you expect to see in terms of the responses from our survey. So we've got 100 business leaders in the not-for-profit, say, talking about what's new, unique in their organization in terms of how they um, move forward. 
to take a moment, have a think. All right, Kim, lead up. So we were we were quite surprised with what came through. There's, it was good to see some words, and yeah, we had a hundred response, over a hundred responses to this, and it was great to see uh, comments around collaboration, impact measurement, investment, uh, customer focus. Unfortunately, it's kind of overshadowed by a lot of the kind of unsures and nothings. So we're hoping as what we talked about in the, the, the presentation and, and over the next couple of slides, hopefully we can have a, a little bit more of a think about strategic plans in terms of uh, where we compete and how we compete, uh, just to make sure that we are kind of thinking about things that we're gonna make our organization unique and uh, more competitive in the, the kind of marketplace. Um, so next slide, please, Kim. So I'm just gonna, it's not a kind of strategic planning conversation unless you get some of the textbooks out from the uh, 1950s and the 1980s. Uh, so just, I'm just gonna talk a couple of slides, one on the Ansoft matrix and one on competitive advantage. So next slide, please, Kim. So you might kind of remember this from the, uh, uh, the dim distant past, but it's still relevant. And the reason why we kind of still pull it out in terms of, if we are moving forward, how are we moving forward? We want to grow, what does that mean? The, the new products, new markets, existing products, existing markets, matrix, it's very, very good. Obviously, the if you're selling existing products or services to your existing market, that's the lowest uh, kind of risk strategy. New products into new markets is the highest risk. Um, but I think having that kind of overlay of what we're doing and why we're doing it when we're setting our strategic plan, just so we can assess the risks and we're building this into our model is kind of relevant. Um, the other bit there is if you're thinking new products or new markets, um, it come, I always think partnerships in the not-for-profit space. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, push the kind of merger conversation anymore. I think that there's enough of that happening already anyway, but at least be thinking partnerships. It is potentially expensive to expand into a new sector or pr new services. Is somebody already doing it? Can we partner with them? is um, something that we probably need to consider more and more of. Um, and the next slide, please, Kim. And, and similarly, the competitive advantage uh, matrix. So this is probably 1980s. Porter must have been involved with it. I think he was involved in everything strategic in the 1980s. So, um, so which markets are we playing? Are we, uh, if we broad target, lower cost was always the, the kind of way to go. If you're, um, can provide things at, at less cost than you make better margins and therefore you'll outlast the competition more? Or are we differentiating our products and services to the extent that we can actually uh, compete against um, other parties there and potentially even charge more money for those services? So just having that clear strategy around what are we doing and why and where does that lead us to? Um, if you could, If anybody was on the that the um, one of the, the webinars that we held recently in the not-for-profit sector, uh, we had uh, Bruce from Sunnyfield um, talking about, we we're actually talking about M&As to be honest, but the, the reason they were considering uh, mergers and acquisitions, they'd invested heavily in their back office um, because they saw their strategic plan was, we're going to get our overhead costs lower than everybody else. So they put a big investment in there, so their net overhead cost is gonna be lower than anybody else. Basically a lower cost play, because in their opinion, which I think is, is valid, um, if you can get your overheads down, then you're gonna kind of win in this space because it is something that everybody looks at. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the how, to, uh, there's a, a, a few kind of things of thinking about how you can compete and overlay that into kind of strategic plan there. So if we go to the next slide, please, Kim. So key takeaways, um, I think from a strategic planning thing, have one is the start and, uh, and make sure if you do have a plan, it is strategic, not just a plan. Um, clearly define where you're gonna compete and how you can compete. Um, we didn't really speak to it this book, but just make sure it ties back to the mission of the organization. So is it aligned with the mission? If not, then you have to kind of revise your mission. Let's have a, um, 
have a, a, a robust conversation about how difficult strategic goals need to be. Is this a, an easy plan to achieve or, or do we actually need some, act, given where the organisation is, does it have to be a bit harder, a bit more ambition? And what's the level of investment that we kind of need to make into that kind of strategic plan? Um, as we said, we kind of harped on this a lot, but you need a financial model with variable assumptions that allow you to rigorously test and cost out the plan. If you've not got that, um, you're probably making strategic decisions on bad information. And as we've said, you know, HLB, we're here, we're happy to help out in terms of reviewing strategic plans, facilitating days uh, and or helping build financial Questions. models. I'm very happy to to open it up to questions. So let's let's just do that now. Okay. Well, I've got look. I've got a, a question for you, Simon. Just in oh, terms good. of what are the advantages of coming to HLB Man Judd, which is a not-for-profit specialist chartered accounting firm, versus a consultant? Because obviously, historically, you know, management consultants, you know, run strategic planning days and look at strategic plans. Um, and I just don't think that this is something that firms are known, professional services firms are known for? Um, yeah, it's possible, and probably it's part of our strategic plan to be kind of beating the drum a bit more so they, they kind of know that we do it. So to answer your question there is, you, you kind of said it in the title, you know, we're a specialist not-for-profit, or we have a big not-for-profit specialisation within our firm, and we are a chartered accounting uh, advisory firm. So we've got a, a wide range of expertise, not only in the, the sector, uh, but also uh, many aspects that are kind of critical to successful strategic planning. Um, one of which we've talked about is the financial modeling piece, because uh, if that's not built properly, um, how are you assessing whether the strategy is worked? And once it's been implemented, is it, is it working? Um, the other thing from a consultant's point of view, where what we see is consultants, you know, kind of come in, do a strategic planning thing and then leave. Um, I think with the range of the services we've got, we can actually assist clients along the journey, put the shoulder to the wheel. So obviously we've, within our advisory capabilities, we've got change management specialized, uh, specialist, business transformation, optimize, uh, automation, I think, which is going to be the topic of the next not-for-profit group, I think, isn't it? But, you know, in terms of how we actually transform businesses from the current state now to that future state. We've actually got people that can help them along the journey, not just tell them they need to do it. Okay, thank you. Is that a good answer? It's a, it, 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 it's it a good is a question. good answer. <laughs> thank you for that. Thank and look, you. I think that's, that is our questions. Um, so th this slide here um, is, we have exciting news uh, that HLB Man Judd was the winner in the best accounting and consultancy services firm in the client choice awards 2021 also best professional services firm and finest and best provider to government and community and these these specific awards are we are voted by our clients and this is for customer service um, which we're all pretty chuffed about and i'm sure that um, when this was released in march you would have heard a bit of a scream at nine o'clock at night and that would have been me um, because it is an exciting time for the team so that's a, a wrap up um, of our webinar for today. In quarter three, we will be focusing on our theme of innovation and technology, um, and we'll be looking to deliver that in July. Um, I have put up a polling question um, in terms of, would you like a HLB representative to contact you regarding your strategic plan? So that brings us to the end of our webinar, and I would like to thank Simon and Natalie for their presentation. And in terms of the strategic planning survey and the results, we will be putting this together as a report and publishing that shortly. And Natalie and I were uh, discussing this morning that we did find um, some particular grants that were opened uh, for funding for capacity building. So if you need any assistance with that, um, please just reach out to myself. So thank you, everyone.